We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. The work I'm going to present today is controversial, and it appears to be particularly unpopular and problem problematic among anthropologists. So I want to thank our symposium organizers, Tatum and Dan, for including me in this important discussion. I'm going to start with the two premises this work is based on. The first premise is that although humans are the most empathetic and cooperative species on the planet, we, are all, we also have a real problem with violence the human suffering as a result of violence that's reported in the weekly news every week of every year documents that observation. The second premise is to the extent that we can find ways to reduce aggression and violence in the future, we should do so. We can all agree that reducing violence is, is, is a good thing, good idea. As scientists, we know that the best solutions to our biggest problems stem from understanding. I'm a comparative physiologist, a comparative biomechanist, and I believe that the fields, that those fields can contribute to a better understanding of human violence in at least two ways. First, biomechanics has a potential to falsify the hypothesis that violence is deeply rooted in our evolutionary past. If the anatomical characters that distinguish the bipedal apes from the other apes do not improve fighting performance, the idea that aggressive behavior was important to our evolution can be discarded. Second, biomechanics also has potential to refute the hypothesis that much of human aggression is, re is rooted in the selection that shaped our mating system. If the anatomy and physiological characters that can be demonstrated to improve fighting performance are not expressed differently in males and females, that is, they're not sexually dimorphic, it becomes very difficult to argue that human violence is linked to our mating system. And I'll have more to say about this in a moment. So the broad field of evolutionary anthropology has played an important role in addressing these questions. But the group of physiologists and biomechanists who are most interested in human evolution have largely been missing in action from addressing these questions. And I'm hoping that can change because the quickest path to a more peaceful future rides on improved understanding. So one of the topics of this symposium is the anatomy and physiology that makes humans exceptional runners. Because running long distance distances is physically demanding, the broad set of anatomical and physiological characters that improve running performance and are at the same time unique to the genus Homo provide really the most compelling argument that selection on endurance running was important in human evolution. We are the primate that evolved to run long distances. Similarly, the physical demands of fighting are high. And regardless of what species we're talking about, when males fight, the stakes in terms of reproductive fitness are also high. 
So if physical aggression was important in the evolution of hominids, it should be reflected in the anatomical characters that distinguish hominids from the other primates. So a word or definition uh, of this phrase, male contest competition. It is the mode of sexual selection in which mating opportunities are obtained through using force or threat of force to exclude same-sex competitors. It's basically uh, referring to male-male fighting. And there's growing evidence from a variety of fields that male contest competition has played a role in our evolution and in human aggression. This evidence comes from physiological, or I'm sorry, phylogenetic comparisons of, of primates, archaeology, population genetics, analysis of male-male, male-female dimorphism based on sexual selection theory, and from evolutionary psychology. And as I alluded to, the empty seat in this discussion is the chair reserved for physiologists and biomechanists. I believe that we can contribute to this endeavor by identifying which characters improve fighting performance and then documenting the extent to which those characters are sexually dimorphic, demonstrating that a character that improves fighting performance is expressed to a greater extent in males supports the hypothesis that we are specialized for male contest competition. Okay, so here is a family tree, a phylogeny of the great apes, and plotted on it are the shared derived characters, the unique characters for the group that we have argued actually improve fighting performance. For the great apes, rel relative to the other primates, the short, the short legs of the great apes and the posture of their feet, the plantigrade foot posture, we have suggested improve fighting performance within, within the great apes. In the lineage that gave rise to humans, the hominid lineage, the bipedal apes, there are a suite of characters that we think improve fighting performance, including habitual bipedalism, some, of, some aspects of the locomotor muscles, proportions of the hand, proportions of the face, facial hair on males, and certain aspects of the dimorphism in upper body strength. Now these are characters that improve performance in a particular type of fighting that is primarily unique to the great apes, grappling and striking with the arms. And in the bipedal apes, the mode of striking is, is unique, uh, and punching, punching with fist. And it's this idea, the idea that our lineage, the hominins, are specialized for punching with fist that has been so controversial. And so what I want to do is just mention, in the time that's remaining in this talk, quickly mention observations from two of our experiments that are, in fact, test of, of the punching hypothesis. The first has to do with the proportions of our hand that not only allow manual dexterity, but also allow the hand to be clenched into a fist, which we argue protects the hand when it's used to strike. And the second has to do with specific predictions about which muscles should be more powerful uh, if we are specialized for, for punching. Which muscles should show the greatest amount of sexual dimorphism, differences between males and females. Okay, so let's take the hands first. This illustration compares the proportions and shape of the hands of a chimpanzee to those of a human. And in comparison to the other great apes, the hands of humans are characterized by shorter fingers, shorter palms, and a longer, stronger thumb. Now, these proportions for 60 years now have been argued to be associated with ma manual dexterity. And there's no doubt that that's true, right? Everything that humans do, we basically do with our hands. We are the most dexterous of, of, of all animals. We're not disagreeing with that. What we are doing is suggesting that, that these hand proportions also allow us to do something else, which is to roll our fingers and clench our hand in a fist, which we're suggesting provides protection to the connective tissues, to the hand itself, to the bones, when we use it to strike. Okay, so the other point I need to mention is that these hand proportions, 
human-like hand proportions, have been around for a long time. To the best that we can determine from the fossil record, they more or less appear at the same time as habitual bipedal evolution, going back uh, over four million years. So here's the experiment. Uh, we, were, we used uh, the arms for cadavers because these were measurements we couldn't take in live subjects. Basically, we mounted the arm on a platform, tied lines to the tendons, and then adjusted the tension in those lines or those tendons to put the hand in whatever posture we wanted to study. The platform was then mounted on a pendulum, which we could swing at a, a weight, that a sus suspended weight that was instrumented with an accelerometer. This allowed us to measure the force of the strike, and then we also put um, strain gauges, instrumented strain gauges, on the metacarpals so that we could measure the strain or the deformation that occurred associated with, with a given force. These are the three hand postures that we studied. On the left, we've got the, the normal clenched fist. In the middle, we have something we call the unbuttressed fist, where the fingers were, were folded against the palm and the, the thumb was extended rather than wrapped. And then the, on the right, we have a slapping posture. Here are the results from one of our subjects. On the y-axis, we have the strain. When you think of this as just the deformation or the bending of the metacarpal. And again, I should say the metacarpals are the bones in the palm of the hand. So we've got the bending of the, of the bone on the y-axis and the force of a given strike on the x-axis. And what you can see is that in the slapping posture, for any given force, the strain is the highest. The strain or the deformation is intermediate in the unbuttressed posture, and the strain, the bending, is lowest in the buttressed posture. So these are results that are entirely consistent with the hypothesis that a clenched fist provi provides protection of the bones when it's used to strike. Okay, so we're not suggesting that human hand proportions evolved for striking. And we're not suggesting that they've evolved solely for manual dexterity. What we're suggesting is that these are the hand proportions that allow us to do both. Both. Manual dexterity requires a relatively difficult musculoskeletal structure, and that structure is important, important enough that it needs to be protected if it's used to strike. If there's truth to this story, you would anticipate that there would be sexual dimorphism in the structure of the hand, because it's primarily males that are doing the punching, right? Females, human females, do strike with a fist, but not with nearly the frequency or the ferocity that males strike with a fist. So you could anticipate there would be sexual dimorphism in the hand associated with a, a functional trade-off. And so here is a, a, a photograph comparing a male and female hand. I'll let you guess which is which. In fact, um, I think it's, we recognize male and female hands in most cases. And the difference is in shape. These, this comparison is useful because the, the palm or the overall length of, of, of the whole hand is similar between these two individuals. And I'm going to plot the, the dimensions of the width on the left in the female hand and then use those same links in, in the equivalent points in the male hand. And you can see that in every metric, the male hand is broader, it's wider, and the bones are more robust. There are also uh, recognized differences in the links of some of, in some of the digits. OK, we've got this sexual dimorphism. What is it about? What we would like to suggest is that it actually represents a functional trade-off. Selection for high levels of dexterity, which are more apparent in the female hand on the left, and selection for some level of increased robusticity associated with striking or punching in the male hand on the right. The other explanation, other than the punching hypothesis that could explain this dimorphism, is simply the division of labor that exists between males and females in foraging subsistence, right? Males and female hunter-gatherers do different, engage in different behaviors simply in foraging. And males are recognized to engage in behaviors that require larger forces applied to the environment. 
So maybe this dimorphism that we're illustrating here is, is a, a function of that division of labor. On to the next experiment. Um, if selection on punching played a role in the evolution of the human musculoskeletal system, we would expect high levels of sexual dimorphism in the muscles that are responsible for punching. So basically the hypothesis is that we, we or we're predicting greater sexual dimorphism in the strength of the muscles that push the hand forward in a punching motion compared to the muscles, sexual dimorphism in the muscles that pull the hand back. That's the prediction. And the way we tested that was with an arm crank ergometer um, in which we could measure the power of a forward push, very similar to a striking motion, and the power in pulling it, reversing it, pulling it back. So again, the prediction is there'll be more dimorphism, a greater difference between males and females in the forward push than in the rearward pull. We also wanted to do the same comparison for a throwing motion. And unfortunately, our arm crank ergometer was not effective for that because of the motion was too awkward. Uh, it just really didn't match a throwing motion. And it also uh, applied when, when our subjects were maximally trying to apply really large strains, uncomfortable strains to the shoulder. So instead we settled for just measuring maximum force in a forward pull versus force, maximum force in a rearward pull. I'm not entirely satisfied with, with this metric, but at this point, and we're thinking about transducers to make a more uh, realistic, more useful comparison, more realistic measurement of power. But at this point, this at this point, this is what we have. So here are the results. Oh, we had 19 female subjects and 20 male subjects. And here's the result for the punching comparison, pushing forward and pulling back. The white bars are the female subjects, the gray bars are the male subjects. And on the left, in the first graph, we have the results for the forward push, and the right bars are associated with the rearward pull. And what we're looking at here is average power during this maximal effort push and pull. And you can see that the dimorphism, the difference between males and females is dramatic. It's over twofold in both going forward and going back. The graph on the right plots the ratio of forward versus backward power for males, I mean for females and for males. And what you can see is that this ratio is significantly greater in males, indicating that there is, in fact, more sexual dimorphism in the forward motion than in the rearward pull. So this is consistent with, uh, with, with punching playing an important role in the evolution of sexual dimorphism of, of strength in the upper body, of the upper body. Here are the results for our forward pull and forward push in a throwing posture. And again, there's large sexual dimorphism, particularly in the forward motion or forward pulling motion. And again, we're looking at force instead of power here. But importantly, there is not, there is a difference, but it's not significant, but in the ratio of forward versus uh, backward force. The lack of significance there is consistent with, with uh, the behavior of punching playing a larger role in the evolution of sexual dimorphism and upper body strength and throwing. But again, I want to emphasize that we're not entirely satisfied, as satisfied with this metric, and we want to revisit uh, this, this study in the future. Okay, we've got two explanations to explain this sexual dimorphism in upper body strength. One is the division of labor associated with foraging subsistence, and the other is this male contest competition, the punching hypothesis. At this point, we can't separate either one, right? We think they're both possible and candidates, likely contributors to the sexual dimorphism in upper body strength. But I do want to mention that this, the division of labor argument associated with foraging subsistence, association with the difference in male and female roles, that explanation for sexual dimorphism does not work for the very similar sexual dimorphism that it is observed in our closest relatives, the chimps, the gorillas, the orangutans. They have very similar sexual dimorphism in, in strength 
but they don't have that division of labor in foraging subsistence. Okay, so in conclusion, I just want to say that what we've argued is that many of the derived, the unique musculoskeletal characters of the great apes and the bipedal apes do improve for fighting performance. And many of these, but not all, are sexually dimorphic. And I want to end with asking why ask this question? The question, are hominins, bipedal apes, anatomically specialized for fighting? Well, the first answer is that the scientific method involves testing alternative hypotheses. So that's what we're doing with, with, with these experiments. The second reason is that among mammals and primates, humans are a relatively violent species. And there's growing evidence that at some level, that violence is associated with selection on our mating system. And then third, if that point is true, if that second point is true, acknowledging and, under, acknowledging and understanding the legacy of male interpersonal and group aggression can help guide policy directed at reducing violence in the future. Okay, so I want to acknowledge the people who have collaborated on the various projects we've been involved with over the past couple of decades on this question. All of them are students, undergraduate and graduate students. They've made the work possible and they've made the work fun. Thank you very much for your attention.